Hey there, I'm John Hayes, and thanks for joining us for this episode of the Founders Trust Podcast. Today, we're discussing how founders can build and lead their startups in ways that are authentic to their mission. I spoke with Lauren Taylor, the founder of AwokeNet, a Chicago-based startup providing reliable, vetted content about social justice work, organizations, and activists. Lauren is fighting the growing trend of misinformation online in order to eliminate the noise that distracts and detracts from the necessary and powerful work that people are doing to advance various social justice causes. Lauren and I discuss what it means to build a mission-driven business, how to lead in a way that's authentic to your mission, and how to make tough decisions in the face of conflicting incentives and beliefs. Lauren brings tremendous energy and passion to his work, and I'm so excited to share one of the most honest and thought-provoking interviews I've done this far with you. And stick around until the end of the episode for a Twitter resource that all first-time founders should be following. So let's jump right in. Today's Startup Spotlight is brought to you by Savier. Savier takes a personalized approach to helping entrepreneurs create a clear path to growth. Through knowledge, coaching, and marketing services, Savier helps entrepreneurs and small business owners apply marketing to achieve their business goals. At Savier, our goal is to empower entrepreneurs to achieve marketing success. Check them out at Savier. That's SavvyEUR.com today. Hey, everyone. Today's Startup Spotlight uh, features a very special guest and a friend from the Founder Institute community. I'm here with Lauren Taylor, founder of AwokeNet. Lauren, it's so great to have you on. It's great to have a chance to catch up and, and learn more about the progress of your company. So how are you today? Not bad. And how do you say big up and respect to the Founder Institute uh, family, <laughs> right? right? I mean, yeah, and it's, and it's and I know we're going to talk about like kind of like stuff like that, but it's like, you know, that's all part of, you know, being a startup and, you know, kind of getting into it. There's a there's a real community of people out there and I'm, we're lucky we're lucky to be a part of one. Right. Absolutely. And it's, you know, that's the reason we first connected. And, and honestly, I think that's the reason both of us kind of had that structure in place to go about first founding our companies. So definitely excited to have a chance to reconnect and excited to learn more about WokeNet and how it's evolved since, you know, you took the company through the, uh, the Founder Institute. So, so let's hop right in, Lauren. Tell us a little bit more about WokeNet, what you're looking to do with the company and where you guys are currently at. Well, basically, AwokeNet, what we want to consider ourselves or how we consider ourselves is we are a platform for social justice organizations that are doing the work, you know, not just, you know, talking, but actually are out here doing work that really, like, impacts folks' lives, okay? And how we kind of came to that, myself and most of our team, you know, we've all been, we all actually into media and technology, but also, you know, into and have long experience, you know, doing, you know, community work and, you know, being involved in community organizations. And we just saw that there's just like way too much noise, way too much misinformation. And it's very easy for people to just label something without really knowing too much about it. So what we decided to do was to try to cut through all of that by trying to build platforms and give some a, a really reliable, credible online uh, source of information that lets the organizations, you could say, speak for themselves. So we, our first uh, effort with that is a website that we put up, awokenet.com, two basically different ways that we do that. You know, some, and some of what you're looking at there in, in the B-roll. One, we have our database or our listing of social justice organizations. Uh, we currently have around 150 organizations from all across the country and even some international, okay? And synopsis, you know, you can go in and see what these organizations are about, uh, contact information on how you can contact these organizations and get involved in what they're doing. So that's our one section. And the second is our news section where we follow you know what these organizations are doing and we're not doing any you know opinions opinionating pontificating a bunch of analysis no what our what we do is just to focus on the work that these organizations are doing all right and 
where we're going with this and what we're trying to build is basically we will have, and we're on our way to doing that, uh, the world's most comprehensive source of information and database on social justice work. And so that's, you know, that's basically what we're about doing. As I say, we are trying to see how quickly we can get to 10,000 organizations in our listing. And so we are looking for support on all sides. We're looking for support from uh, people in the social justice world to, you know, connect with us, you know, give us the information about what they're doing in their, their organizations. And we're also looking for uh, support within the, the, the business community, especially now at this time when they are talking about what are some of the real things that we, uh, you know, need to do to, you know, try to bring more equity, you know, both uh, uh, within various companies and just within the, you know, society and in the, the market in general. So that's, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. It's an absolutely terrific mission, Lauren. And I remember when you and I first talked about a very early of the idea, um, I guess perhaps a year ago now, I can't believe it's yeah. that, that long, but it's just been- And I will state, and I will state here, you know, and just to, just to, to, to you know, put it and emphasize it really the, and that was part of the, 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 the benefit of the, the process. I mean, you were willing to say, hey, look, you know, this is not necessarily my uh, uh, particular area of expertise, but, you know, a lot of the insights that you were able to, to, to give us really, you know, helped set us on some direction, you know, that helped us kind of clarify what we were doing about our mission. And like I say, so I keep going back to that. It's so important as a startup, you know, that you connect with other people who are, you know, have experience and are doing the same thing that you're doing. Oh, absolutely. And so I really, yeah, we really appreciate that, John, what you, you know, what you did. Oh, no, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I was honored that, you know, we were, we were having the chance to have these great conversations and discussions about how we take this from just the idea stage and, and put it into execution. And, and it was one of those companies, you know, sometimes you just hear an idea, right? And, and you see the passion from the founder, like I did with you. And it's just so easy to connect with in the, the passion's genuine, the mission's genuine. And that's really what, you know, I, I would, I really wanted to have you on the podcast for today was to talk about how you build a company that not only says it has a mission, but lives it and executes it in everything you do for your team, your partners, your customers. And so that's really why I think AwokeNet is a great um, example of this type of mission-driven work. Obviously, the timing could be more perfect for, for your mission, right? And it, the, I, I, this, you know, fun. somehow, sometimes it really, you all, it's, I don't know the exact way that I'm trying to think of it, but sometimes you really almost, we really were almost having this feeling like, is this kind of thing really happening? Because literally we have been working on various forms of this idea for like two years, right? And so to see the, just what's going on outside in the world seemed to just so closely, you know, kind of follow the direction that we were going in. You know, it's almost like sometimes, you know, we would kind of be pinching ourselves. But then again, at the same time, it's sort of like, this is real. Oh, absolutely. You know, what we're going through, this is, this is real. And so, yes, I mean, we and, we, and we also feel really, you know, fortunate that there are a lot of folks around that are recognizing that and are saying, hey, you know, the, the time is now. Your time is now. Awoke's next time is now. And just you could say in general, all our time is now, because I think, there are a lot of people that really sincerely want to see this because yeah, it's just more fun if we all get along. Right. <laughs> it's just, it's just right. Right. And it's, you know, and it, it's such a pressing problem from, from two different angles, obviously the social justice piece and, you know, ensuring quality in our institutions, our society, just culturally how we think and approach things. And also how the issue of misinformation, you know, very opinion driven, you know, news co news coverage and media coverage how that inflames people how that leads to division and so that's what i think is so incredibly powerful about a, a woke net is it it's attacking both of those pieces in a way that really strives to you know correct or just provide better more qualified information about a lot of these problems and and you know the respective solutions that people are trying to work towards right because 
I think a lot of times in the media, we hear about so, so much of the opposition, right? People butting heads, people not getting along. But the reality it, is it gets more, exactly, it, it's more stimulating for folks. And also, too, you know, and, and quite honestly, I think even um, you could say what they refer to as mainstream media has been really heavily influenced by, you could say, the social media ethic where the objective of most people that put up content on social media is how much attention can you get on it? Absolutely. Absolutely. How many likes, likes. how many yeah. views, right? right? And I've been literally, I've been reading, you know, what it was really interesting piece that I read the other day that, you know, when they, for instance, they talk about some of like the, you know, missing for, you know, without getting into that, going down too far that rabbit hole, but a lot of the misinformation that had, you know, come out around, around, the events that happened in the Capitol on January 6th, you know, right. we all know what we're referring to. But in any case, a lot of the people who were content creators that they would talk to once they were really able to engage with them admitted that a lot of the content that they were put, putting out was not even toward some particular kind of like agenda or some kind of objective, but just what could they do to get more eyeballs? Absolutely. You know, what could they do to really could a, provoke and you know cause some kind of attention that would basically you know get them more views and let's face it you know kind of like help them monetize it so i guess kind of getting back to you know what we what you had you know talked about before in terms of you know how do you get or or how do you you know involve yourself in a, or start a company that really not only reflects a mission but lives it and once again, you're not just saying it just because, you know, we're in the Founder Institute fan club. But and I think it's something that I kind of like knew already. But, you know, one of the very first things that, you know, we talked about was this idea is like, look, well, two things. Look, do you see yourself doing this for 20 years? I mean, you know, we, 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 we think about the benefit that we're thinking about getting out of our, our businesses. You know, we're going to start this business and if it's successful, this is going to happen and we're going to be able to do this and we kind of, you know, see, and you know, which is important too, to kind of picture, you know, what kind of life you're going to have if your company is successful. But more, more to that is, you know, is this something that you're going to want to be spending your time on for like 20? And I think most people, when they go, whoa, wait, 20, it's intimidating. 20 what, how, what, how long? I mean, I I thought I thought that this was a an accelerator, you know. No, no, son, we're accelerating you into what you know. I, I get, to try to tell this story like kind of real quick. You know, in a previous life, I was in the music industry, right? Uh, we had a very and as a young, young and as a youth, as an up and coming musician, I had the opportunity to work on the technical crew for a group called the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Now, if you're okay. a jazz fan, okay, right. I mean, these guys are so Chicago. I mean, it's like it's <laughs> it's tattooed on their forehead, really. They were, we're from Chicago. You know, I mean, they were so, <laughs> they were very proud of that, right? So anyway, I got to tour with them. We're in upstate New York. We play, they played a show that was sponsored by a local bank, the bank, or whoever it was decided to have, you know, some kind of like dinner or like a thing for us afterwards, you know, really nice. Okay. We got to sit, of course, at the big guy's table. Right. So we're talking to his personal assistant and she says to one of the, one of the guys in the, in the band, Oh, what you guys do is really like interesting. I think I could work for you a half a day. And he says to her, which half would you like midnight to noon or noon to midnight? <laughs> You know, and, and so I think that kind of typifies what, what you know, and, and one of the things I learned from these guys is, yes, most successful artists, most successful musicians, they run their music thing like a small bit, like it's a small business and they and they conceive of it and think of it as a as a business. And yeah, you start your own business. That's your work day. That, that's that's your day. Right. Noon to midnight and then midnight to noon. And the reality, and, and, if, and if you're not wrong, down, right? right? The other one that you want to ask yourself is, would you do this if you didn't get paid for it? <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a question that people really struggle with answering. I don't, right? And I think a lot of people, when they start businesses, if they were really to confront that, like, hmm. 
And what I can tell you is, yes, all of us that are doing the work, Matt, we, we were doing this and we are doing this. In fact, part of the thing that we even do at AwokeNet is figure out how to incorporate, uh, you know, the things that we are still doing, you know, on the ground day to day. How do we, you know, how do we, how do we incorporate that? Okay. And I'm going to try to see if I can find this video. Okay. Let's see if I can, let's see if I get to share a screen with two monitors. Okay. Whatever. Okay, a select window or screen series. Uh, uh, no, I, I really want to. I really want to see if we can. I can share this right here. All right, let's see here. Let's just share this one. Okay, can you see like a woke net? You see the the screen? Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna just throw this out there. Throw this up. Seriously, seriously, this is only gonna take a second on here. But you, what, and what I kind of wanted to demonstrate was the kind of things that we are. Where is it? Here we go. Ta-da! Say so the miracle of modern technology here. <laughs> We're all getting very used to it with uh, the COVID world, right? Most okay, modern. right. So you talk about the COVID. Can you see that? Let's see there. That, it looks like that. we can see your title slide there, Lauren. Okay, then that means I got it on the wrong screen. How about there it is? There we go. There we go. See this, this, and, and you know, okay, and I, I appreciate the patience of you and and everyone, uh, you know, to for me to show you this. But like I said, this is the, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about, right? Is that you know, these, this is the kind of stuff we were doing anyway, right? This is the kind of stuff that I would be doing anyway. We were able to pull together like a, a group of people here in my neighborhood, you know, some nurses, you know, some of the community groups, uh, one of the local parishes, more or less, you know, to, to and, and we're doing this as a way to kind of, you could say, help spread awareness in our community in advance of the vaccine. Now, like I said, this is stuff we would all, everyone that's involved in the rope net, this is the kind of stuff we would be doing anyway. And this is the kind of stuff that we're, you know, still, I, you know, I can't help it. We can't help it to do stuff like this. Right. Now we have, now, now it's great because we have a platform for it. Right. Now, when we do stuff like this, we've got a website that we can put this stuff on. We've got like a network of or, other organizations that we can reach out to. Right. And so once again, that's part of how you kind of like live the mission. What are you doing? What are you into? What is it that you're, you know, that already is kind of like moving you? Right. And yeah, you know, a lot of it is we're saying, hey, you know, if 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 we could make a more of a living out of this, maybe we can devote more of our time and energy to it. Right. Well, and that's a great point, Lauren. And, and I'm a huge proponent of the idea that entrepreneurship is one of the best means to develop and implement solutions to some of our biggest problems, right, as a society, both economically, culturally, with our political institutions. And so I think, you know, we need to think about it in terms of how do we come up, not just with short term solutions, but with sustainable solutions, right? You know, things that, as, such, as you talked about, when you're able to generate an income out of this, well, then that means that you can, you know, build a sustainable business to continue making progress towards that solution for that problem, right? And I think you can't, right. I can only be one place at one time. So if I'm driving a UPS truck, or I'm, you know, sitting behind a desk, you know, figuring out how I can make and which, once again, you know, maximum respect to people that are driving UPS trucks, right? We do oh, not sure. want to in any way, you know, try to like diminish anything like that. But as I say, you know. Another another way that I can kind of like say is that really I, I tell people, especially like in the last, let's say, you know, two, three years, even, you know, even even be, be, be before the the change in this situation we were in before. But in any case, I could be someplace and they're talking about school reform. They could be talking about street violence. Eventually, somebody stands up and says, you know, if we don't get some more money up in here, all of this is some noise, right? And so even the, you could say, social justice people, you know, even people in the social justice world now see that there is some connection between, like, development. You know, there is a connection between 
you know, public health, That's right? Sure. You know, how, how, what, what, how are we going to, you know, quote, so to speak, you know, work to better our communities if what we're, you know, worried about is, you know, catching some virus and dying from it. Right. You know, and so all of the, all of these things, all of these things like, you know, kind of, you know, work together. So for instance, one of the very first things that we did at AwokeNet was to decide that we were doing this as a for-profit business, right? One, as you say, to kind of go with this sort of new direction of, okay, you know, it, it shouldn't always be, you know, pigeonholed to this sort of, sort of one realm that, you know, entrepreneurs can also step up and take a role, right? That's one reason we did it. The second reason we did it is that as a for-profit company, right, we have to be mindful that we are returning, whoever it is that we are getting our, our support from, we have to be very clear that we're also returning value to those people. Absolutely. You know, that they're not just doing it literally as a charity case, or they're not just doing it as like a feel good that they, they can then, you know, stick on a company flyer and then they don't have to, you know, be engaged anymore. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's a really key point because, you know, when you start building a, a sustainable company towards this, it, it's not just something where you kind of throw money at the problem, feel good about yourself and step away, right? This is an actual, you know, organization making long-term progress to provide a solution as opposed to, as you talked about, kind of the, you know, the PR feel good story, right? And I want to dig into that a little bit because I do think there are even, you know, kind of in, in social entrepreneurship and things you know there are companies that kind of claim to be having this type of greater impact and, and don't get me wrong they're you know i'm sure they're doing good but the reality is that sometimes they're just kind of doing it more for the beneficial pr light you know and, and maybe this is a little bit of cynicism on my part but you know how how have you thought about cutting through the noise to not only you know make sure a woke net's really branded in, in an authentic way but also to identify kind of other companies and individuals who really are focused on on the impact and on building sustainable solutions as a very to very interesting beyond. because quite honestly one of the other challenges that we have had as we have started to develop this is a lot of you know when when people kind of see what it is that we're doing okay needless to say one of the very kind of first issues that we even had in terms of the organizations that we're listing right is we said oh oops we, we got to come up with some sort of standard or criteria because the last thing that we would want to do, right, is be cavalier about who we're putting on. And then, you know, at some point in time in the future, we find out that these people are not about what they're what right. they're about or that we find out like that one of the founders or one of the, you know, principals inside this organization you know, really does not exemplify the type of values that we wanted to do. So before we, you could say, launched it publicly, one of the main things that we did was to, you know, come up with a criteria, you know, for the organ for the organizations that we list and, you know, and being very clear about it and also being very clear about that it's a process. Okay, now why do I give all that backstory? We, of course, have to have a kind of a similar thing for the companies that we wanted to work with. When people started seeing that, what they kept trying to suggest for us to do was literally to kind of like almost even pivot our business and say, hey, instead of just having this website, why don't you, you know, because and da, 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 and you could be, you know, you could give them your good housekeeping seal that you have like vetted them as the company that stands up for social and Quite honestly, it sounds interesting and it probably could be something that we develop in the future. But my short answer for that is one that we have developed, a, 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 not as extensive as for the organizations that we list, but you know, we do have a, a criteria for the companies that we want to work with. And as cheesy and corny as this sound, I'm just an optimist, you know? I really do think that if we're talking about the Fortune 500, right, we don't need to start with all 500 of them. You know, if there's five of them, if there's 50 of them where there's people inside that are really sincere, right, and, you know, you've got to give these guys, uh, you know, their window of humanity too. You know, I think that a lot of times 
you know, we want to talk about people in, you know, business, especially people that run business and that they think only in terms of their bottom lines. Well, hey, that would be, that's, that's not so friendly on our part. You know, why should we, and it sounds as cheesy as it sounds, why should we deny them their humanity? You know, why should we deny the people who run these companies a chance to, you know, examine their own consciousness, a consciousness, right? I always remember the whole football players taking the knee thing, right? Right. And Jerry Jones from the Dallas Cowboys took the knee and they were doing all of this back calculus of okay he's doing and you know and why what is he considering and you know the people that are there and i just said hey look i just said hey look wait a minute is it possible that jerry jones you know has some little window of humanity where after decades of contact with black players and their families he starts to see these people as human beings Right. And says, look, I got enough money to wipe my butt with, you know, if I have to forego a dollar here or two so that I can really show these people that I see them. I'm not going to take that from him. You know, I'm not going to spend even spend a lot of time trying to figure out why he's doing that. Just big up Jerry Jones. You know what I mean? So let's. So part of part of my thing is, like I said, you know, I'm the optimist. Right. And, you know, I'm going to give people a chance to demonstrate first that they are not, you know, thinking, you know, with heart and head. I'm going to give them the opportunity to show that. And as I say, you know, I guess, are you, are you, you're here in Chicago too, are you here in Chicago, right? I am, I'm here. Man, do you know that there are at least 200 companies just here in the Chicago area who are doing, you know, a hundred plus million dollars a year worth of business, at least there's got to be at least oh, I'm two sure. or three hundred companies. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you've got some of the major, biggest, biggest companies in the world right here in Chicago. They watch; they're watching the news too, right? right, right. They 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 know what's going on here, and she, they live here too. So we're gonna, get, you know, and as I say, we don't need all two hundred of them. You, you know, if there's more, 10 right? of these guys, if there's 20 of them, if there's five of them that want to get started with us, that's that's good enough for us to, to get started. And so I think, you know, to extrapolate that for, you know, anybody else, it's kind of the same thing. You know, start where you are. Right. Start where you are with it, you know, and, and don't worry. Don't worry about what that guy is doing over there. That was I mean, once again, you know, shameless plug for Founder Institute. What was so great about Founder Institute was, go. you know, watching up you, you right. He, uh, John knows these guys. These, this is these are some of the guys that we that you know graduated in our cohort. This is a father son duo. They've got an energy drink. I mean, man, seriously. Every time I see something, it's like you know, it's like I'm. It's like it's my company. I swear to God, you know. Right after I got to know these guys, and you you know you see what they are, what you know what they're about. You see what kind of people they are. You know you 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 know you feel like the connection they're giving the support for you for your thing. And I swear, man, every time I see something about these guys, I'm it's like, you know, it's like I did it, really. I mean, I'm I'm sleep I'm sleeping in this sweatshirt. Yeah, for real. Gerald and, and Colton Horn, who are the founders of Brick Deal, are, are terrific guys. Uh, I hope be, you have them on this podcast eventually, they'll man. Be on, really, they'll be on soon, very soon. I hope so. I'll be front and center, and I'll be front and center watching it. But you honestly, know, for real, you know, you touch on, on on your optimism, and I think that's one of the the very first things that you know I picked up on when I first spoke with you, just even informally. I think at a Founder Institute event, and you know, you have to have both just as an entrepreneur, but especially for one living on a mission, you have to have that kind of optimism, right? Because entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. There's going to be a lot of good days, a lot of tough days, and it's going to be even tougher when, you know, you're, you're building your company around approaching tough and heated topics in the media, right? Like you are with the woke net. And so 
you know, I, I just give you so much credit, and I think it's a testament to you as a you, founder. You, you, know, you know one, you know one way, and if I'm throwing out advice, you know one way that you, it's how to develop that. One way that I developed that: pick one thing outside of your comfort zone and and, and try it. Mine was sales, right? So literally, I've never been able to tell. Honestly, I mean, you <laughs> my, you'd be surprised. I mean, put it this way: promotion and marketing is two different things. Because basically, you know, the as a performer or whatever, as a you know, marketing, it's like you get to that hard conversation, and then you could say, okay, now here's the sales guy to basically, you know, reach in your back pocket and <laughs> snatch that wallet out. I mean, it, really, and you would. I don't know if you've had that experience. You know, you've made the pitch. The guy loves it. You know, everyone's like feeling good, right? You're setting up like the timetable for everything. You know, you, you set the thing, you're going to, you, you drafted up the, all the agreements. And then it really feels it's like, you know, you getting the wallet at the guy. You, give me, give, give me, give me. You know, fast, and fast, it's just fast, like, you say, fast. wait a minute, two days ago, you were really up into this, you know, <laughs> right? And so, like, and so, like I said, mine. And so, literally, I sold gym memberships. I tried to do that for a half a minute. I tried selling cars for half a minute. Hated it the whole time that I was doing it. But I knew, look, suck it up, guy. Suck it up, you know. So, and for some people, it's not that. You know, you, you might have some salesmen that start a business that are great at sales, and they may have some other. So, what I would say is, find something outside of your comfort zone. And, and and sit with it a little while. Absolutely, no, it's terrific advice. And, and the reality is that if you are interested in entrepreneurship or starting a company or being an early employee, you you naturally end up doing that, right? So you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? To, to even consider wanting to pursue that type of journey because it's that's the day to day, right? And it's it could be, you know, learning how to do some sort of you know, tech development aspect to sales to, you know, public speaking. A lot of people don't like public speaking. So you, you have to naturally have some sort of acknowledgement, if not comfort with being uncomfortable. So I'm well, it's so great, for instance, too, right? You know, and you probably remember some of the ones that like were just like almost like vehement about their lack of, of, of public speaking skills, right? They would come in and like would be insisting that, okay, if, if this is what's required for me to be a founder, I'm screwed, right? And what how, how you kind of almost like sort of see that, you know, even within that, that almost is not so much that had its own charm, but you know what I mean? If a person who was able to kind of get through that and you would say, yeah, you know, and, and it just became just another thing to kind of like admire them for. Here's a guy who's obviously not comfortable with this and he just gave a presentation and it was understandable and it was clear and he was focused on it and you know bravo i mean it was just you know so whatever your whatever your quote uncomfort zone is you know get it you know get into it and like you say what it will do it will get you used to what it feels like to be uncomfortable and realize it's not the end of the world right right and you know you end up Kind of turning those weaknesses into strengths a lot of times or at least places where you feel like you can handle yourself right you don't have to be the best public speaker in the world but you can at least handle yourself and speak to your company and and, and that's really important and you know one aspect i kind of want to dive into a little bit about that is i think and i saw this with some pitches particularly in the founder and CDS, as you go further in the program and sometimes people start with an idea and it naturally evolves over time but sometimes you can see that the mission or kind of the purpose or goal starts to change, right? And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But for some people, that that mission finding occurs much later than for others. And so I guess one question I have for you, Lauren, is do you think it's possible for companies to, you know, maybe adopt a mission later on rather than truly being founded on one? And is that possible hmm. to... You know, really allow you to to live the mission in the course of building the business and, and not to say that wow you know, finding your mission later on is is necessarily a bad thing but i do think it, it changed the dynamic a little bit in how you think about your company how you think about 
who you're serving as your, your target customer, et cetera. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, and, and what I'm trying to do is kind of like imagine like a scenario, like I guess a good one would be, for instance, okay, like these guys, this is an energy drink. But see, it's not because they do have a mission. See what I mean? It's it, it, which, which we won't go in, but okay, I'm trying to see if I can kind of put myself like in the head of, 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 of something, you know, like that, because I guess, how would you say it? One of, one of the things I guess I also had to learn, right, was this idea that as corny as it sounds, everyone ain't like me, right? So not everybody even has or even maybe knows like what their mission is. You know, a lot a lot of what we have experienced, for instance, with the woke net is, you know, people who reach out to us saying, hey, I want to do something, but I don't know what. So, you, could, you know, maybe everyone doesn't carry that around. What I would say, right, is once again, <clears throat> I do think that most people when they start their business, if they continue with it for any length of time, if you stick with it for more than, um, you know, if you, if you stick with it for more than, you know, like a year or so, you will have kind of like determined, hey, this is kind of quote, something I like, okay? And as I said, that's, that's what I kind of would go back to. The way that you could take a company and sort of give it a mission is by really being kind of clear and honest with yourself about, okay, well, what is it that sort of that I'm interested in? Okay, so for instance, uh, let's say that you've got some a business that one way or another is, a, is an online service. You know, either you're, you know, selling online or you're doing something like me that uh, you know, you've got a, a website. It's 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 something that has to do with being online. Okay, well, believe it or not, um, internet access, you know, access to broadband internet is now a social justice issue, right? I mean, here in Chicago, you probably have. I think they've estimated there's like something like six thousand families with children in the Chicago public schools who don't have internet. Right. Okay. And now that, you know, you, you even got the thing, I don't know if you saw it, the teachers are about ready to go on strike because they don't want to go back in the classroom. Okay. And that's, that's where the loggerhead comes, right? What are those 6,000 families going to do? They said there's something like 70, 80,000 students who basically are needing to go back to school. Why? What they've come to find out for a lot of families, the school isn't about education, it's childcare so they can go to work. So once again, you've got your online business, right? How do you, how do you quote, make a mission? Well, you know, you find some aspect of what it is that you're already doing and what it is that you're already in a sense, quote, passionate about that you can connect, that you can connect with the business, right? And then literally, as I say, I think, you know, as you open yourself up to it, you would see that even on the, the simplest level, you know, you have you got a corner grocery store well do you know how many you know how many you know food pantries and you know programs there are to feel there's almost just about anything that you're doing right with your life or with your business or with your work there's probably something going on out there within the realm of either you know some people aren't even all that keen on the term social justice right Right. But, you know, there's something out there that you connect can connect with it to, quote, give it a mission. The other thing that I would say is that, hey, look, you know, as we were talking about before, you know, healthy economic activity is also something that we are all, you know, saying is, you know, important to develop health, healthy communities. So if your mission you know, your mission doesn't necessarily have to, you know, be a social justice one. Maybe your mission is, it really is to, you know, have a more efficient grocery service, right? And that's going to provide, you know, work for people. And that's going to, you know, help, you know, if you can help people, you know, save, you know, 20 minutes out of their day that now they're, you know, devoting to their families or maybe, you know, devoting to their social justice work. So your mission doesn't necessarily have to be uh, like, you know, like mine, a social justice mission, but just that it's something that you can kind of be focused on. And I would say does have a quality that it provides some benefit beyond just your company and your bottom line. 
Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily have to be a social mission, but it, it, it should have some impact on something beyond just you and your company. And that, and that's terrific advice, Lauren, because I think a lot of times people do want to start ventures that have that greater mission, right? I think sometimes people, you know, maybe they force the issue a little too much and there's not a natural fit because you still do kind of have to have a, you know, a viable business model, right? Um, as you talked about, there's a difference between not-for-profit versus kind of building a, a business. And there are, you know, advantages and disadvantages. There's certain differences to both approaches, right? And in, in different kind of perspectives on that. I think one thing that is maybe difficult for people is how do you build the business, right, to keep it a sustainable business while not sacrificing things for the mission or, or principles along the way, right? And I think... I mean, you can put it, you, you can call all kinds of analogy. I don't know if you remember, there was this film, Robert Redford, Woody Harrelson, and Demi Moore, right? The film was this millionaire guy, he goes to, to the Demi Moore, Woody Harrelson characters and say, look, I'll give you a million dollars if you let me sleep with her, right? And what was interesting about the movie was just this, you could say the whole kind of like psychological you know, aspect, and it really kind of got down to this sort of issue of, you know, how, you know, what's valuable, what's important. And so anyway, I can remember, yeah, it was, and she, she was, she was kind of special with her ex-girlfriend, you know, I won't go into a lot of the background, but we're talking about this movie and she was almost like on the advocate of like, what, what, you wouldn't, what, for a million dollars? You wouldn't? I said, no. I wouldn't do it for 10 million. I wouldn't do it for 100 million. I said, look, if you don't have a line in your life where you say, look, this line, I, I wouldn't do this for money, right? And if you don't have that, you know, then, then where, where, does it, where does it go? Where does it go from there? So, no, I wouldn't do it for $10 million, right? You know? I can, and I can give you so many stories like this. And if, if there's anybody that's watching this, if you really want a real life example of it, spend some time reading about Dave Chappelle, right? He has got people tied up in knots. This guy like turned down a $60 million right. deal. I think it was with, with Netflix, Netflix or HBO yeah. with Netflix. Okay, $60 million. They still, they still can't figure that out. But he has been adamant the whole time. It's like, look, you know, that's not that's not why we're what that's not why we're doing that. That's not why I'm here, you know, right? And he's smart enough to know. I mean, let's face it, you know, and and I haven't experienced this personally, but I've kind of seen it. Difference between thirty million dollars and sixty million dollars. It's not. It doesn't really. It's not going to really change, you know. It's not really change your life. Really. It's not really. It's not, you know. So that that that's that's the answer to it. Is I think first you really have to kind of like determine, you know, and it goes back to the thing what we're saying. Would you do this for no money? Would you do what you're doing for no money? Right? That that's kind of all part of it. But you know, where are those lines? Where where are those boundaries? You know, where are those boundaries that you have? And be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself about what those are. And remind yourself, remind yourself, right? You know, they, and, I, and I'm doing all those little kind of things, all, them little, all those little, we, we do, they work and you do those, you know, pull your business plan out and look at it every six months or so at least. Do that, you know, they, you, you'll hear that advice on like so many, you know, podcasts and videos to the point where you know, yeah, whatever, but no, do that, you know, pull your business plan out. You know, if you, if you've got a, a, an investor pitch, an investor pitch deck, you know, put it on your calendar that every three months or whatever, I'm going to take a look at this stuff and remind yourself, cause you might even have to, you know, remind yourself. I mean, like I said, every now, you know, once a month or so, or every other month, I go and look at that page that we put up about what our criteria is for our organization, for our company, and make sure, hey, is AwokeNet doing that stuff? <laughs> you know, you're out there talking about what all these other companies are doing. Is AwokeNet, are, are, you know, are you doing this? 
the stuff that you're out there telling everybody else you want them to do. Are you doing this? Right. You have to live it, right? You really do. And you, you touch on a few interesting points there, Lauren, in that. And I at least I'm speaking from, from my experience, but entrepreneurship is so involves a very healthy degree of self-reflection, right? And and being honest with yourself to a way that sometimes almost hurts or sometimes almost, you know, makes you feel bad about yourself if you haven't lived up to those standards that you've kind of set for yourself or, or lived up to those lines because you really have to humanize the business and think about what can I do? What do I want to do? What should I be doing? Right. In a way that you have to answer those questions in an authentic and genuine way in order to, I think, really live your mission. Yeah. And you got to let yourself screw it up sometimes. Right. Don't beat right. yourself up. And I think you Don't have to, yourself up. Right? You you know, have to screw it up to get yeah. to where you ultimately need to step forward. Right. So, and you know, I think, and and to add on that, when you're talking about being honest with yourself, that's that's the one thing I say. When it's you're being honest with yourself, they mean just that. I mean, it's possible, and you should, you know, have a dialogue with yourself. And look, you you you're not obligated to reveal it to anyone. You know, right. yeah. when you take this look at yourself, and that's how you can get to be honest about you, with yourself. Because a lot of times, I even think I even kind of was in that. I'm having this conversation with myself, but what I'm really doing is I'm talking through the ether to somebody that I'm thinking <clears throat> that I'm either going to impress or that I need to validate it or whatever, right? And that, that's different than talking to yourself because what you're doing is you're already pre kind of formulating in mind what are you going to be your defenses and what's going to be your rationales and justification. No, if you talk to yourself, without this kind of pressure that there's going to be somebody evaluating, you may be able to kind of come up with like some insights that, you know, really make a difference. And guess what? You're not obligated to share it with anyone. Right. You don't have to put any polish on them, right? You don't have to post anything about it. You don't have to. No, this was the conversation that you had with you, right? And if it, and if it brings you to something, you know, cool. You know, I mean, the, uh, just, an analogy that I'd say, folks, right? This is how, for instance, when I when I was, you know, in the music industry, this is how I knew that I was doing something that I wanted wanted to do. And when I when I knew that it was time for me to want to do something else, I'd tell somebody, "Look, I can play a song that I composed. I'd be sitting alone in my room and play a song that I composed and bring myself to tears." And I don't have to share that experience with anyone. I don't have to share that with anyone, right? And that's how, I, and I said, and, and when that changes, that's when I know it's time for me to, to start doing something else. And so I don't know if there's kind of even a parallel, you know, once again, it all goes back to what we're saying about, would you do this for no money? You know, are you staying on your mission? But, you know, you don't, what you, like I said, what you, what you come up with when you talk to yourself, yeah, if you want to share it, and sometimes it's good to share it, but you know, sometimes that's what you kind of need to be able to be really honest with yourself. There's kind of a sanctity, right, or a purity of of, of that moment. You're not this, this exercise. Honest. The exercise of looking, reflecting on yourself is not about trying to build rationalizations that you're going to use to justify this to other people. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely, and and that's really important as a founder when you are tasked with making critical decisions on a daily basis, right? It's a little bit different when you have an established company, but when you're just getting started, everything can can seem and is often a big deal, right? So, you know, Lauren, this has been a, a terrific conversation. Want to finish it up with our three question grand finale here. Um, first of which is honestly, what's been your favorite moment working with AwokeNet thus far? Is there, has there been one or two really things that stood out and say, wow, this this feels awesome, or this has been like my favorite moment of the process so far. Okay, well, and this, this is a couple. Of the, the, the all, this is a kind of inside, kind of founder institute thing, but you know, we we had different sort of, let's say, reviews that we had to do, right? right. That were very kind of important and critical to 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 finishing, and part of the stipulation would be for some of these review processes, if you didn't kind of completely measure up, there might have to be some really like intensive, like makeup work that you have to do. 
special. Well, assignment. my second review session, I passed it without having to do any of that. So, and really, it was just like, I was like, you know, like it was, it was like really, it's like one of those three Stooges cartoons where they all start going, success, 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 <laughs> right? Outside of that, though, and I'm not kind of being facetious about it. I mean, I've had like, you know, anything that's happened, it's always there's other kind of people or there's other people that we're connected with. And there'd be so, there's been so many like folks that have been like supporting this that to identify one, I'd almost be kind of like dissing the, the other guys because, oh, no, no, you guys. Re-. So anyway, what I would say is one of the most rewarding experiences of this was putting together the team, right? Because to be able to go out and find folks who see what it is, you know, kind of get it what you're trying to do and not just get it, but say, hey, I want to be a part of it and really kind of bring something to it where it even becomes their thing, too. Right. And so I'm really like fortunate with that. My co-founder, chief technical officer, John Paul Thomas. Right. He. Also, too, like I say, he's a, a systems design specialist, right? But also somebody very involved with, you know, community work. I mean, it was great. Really, I didn't talk to that guy more than like 10, 12 minutes before he before he joined, before he joined on and agreed to be my co-founder, right? I mean, it's like you, you know. got it like like that, right? And then our other main team member. Crystal and Charity, who is our chief content officer, was the same thing. It was literally like she started doing this just simply because, you know, I'd have some particular task. You know, you know, we had a, you know, we're friends, right? I'd have some particular task. I said, well, I can help you out with that. Okay, well, I can help you out with that. I can help you out with that. And then so eventually, right, right, she says, I guess, I guess, I guess, I just got to jump into this. So that has that has been the really the most rewarding part of it was putting together the team. And I know as we grow, I'm just going to have more of those kind of experiences. That's terrific. And then honestly, because you're working with, you know, your team members on a day to day basis, it's it's great that that's one of the best parts of, of your experience so far, because, uh, you know, you, you spend a lot of hours and you you're working together toward to building something great. So, yeah. And 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 the, and the and it is right. And, you know, and I don't know how if you but and I think I've actually heard even other like kind of founders that I talk about it. Right. It is also, too. It's really rewarding and gratifying. Like I said, when you see it grow and you see other people make it their thing, too buy into it right absolutely take ownership of it as you talked about. yeah they take you know they start to take you know maybe not as completely or in, in, in the fullest scope that you do you know i am the of the three of us i am the one that is you know putting the most in it actually in terms of ours but you know they you, you really feel that they that they that they have ownership of it just as i do absolutely absolutely all right so question two in what ways do you think that you personally have grown the most through this experience of, of founding and building a woke net? Hard, tough skin. Literally, you know, it's, not everybody's going to groove with it. And conversely, you know, I don't have to, how you said, I don't have to completely buy into a thing to support it. Right. You know what I mean? I Absolutely. can like, I can like it a little bit and that's cool. But the, 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 I think that that's the main thing. It's just thicker skin. Absolutely. No, and it's it's a just like when you're playing guitar and you get calluses on your fingers, right? It takes a little bit of time to develop, but once you get it, you know, you, you understand how to be resilient. For sure. Well, uh, another one of the – put it this way, it, it, and it, it's it, – it, how would you say it? A lot of it is also, you could say, reinforcing things that maybe you kind of believed a little bit, but like you said, it really wasn't incorporated or, you know, you didn't really fully encompass, encompass it into the way that you live. But real quick, I tell, you know, this is a, a thing we have like in the entertainment industry. Remember Barnum and Bailey yep. Circus, P.T. Barnum? His famous saying, the number of people who will not come to your event is unlimited. <laughs> so just get Same over it. Get o- <laughs> so, get, so get over it. Right. Every, you know, most, most of the people, you know, if, if they're what we got – close to 5 billion people on the planet, right? I can imagine that there's quite a few billions of people out there that are not going to like the woke that. I mean, that's okay. 
<laughs> at least if there's at least a few billion people out there that aren't going to like this, but it's okay. <laughs> Can't take it personally, right? Well, we got to see what what we can do with that other three billion, right? That's well, that's trick. right. That's right. You got to take advantage of the opportunity. You got to take it. You know, you got to look at the half full thing. So the the two or three billion that don't like it, that still leaves a couple of billion that might. <laughs> right. And that's enough, right? Absolutely. So, all right, Lauren. Grand finale question: What's the one thing your company needs to take that next big step or to reach that next big milestone? And and how can this community of you know, the, the Founders Trust podcast and, and listeners help you get to, you know, that next step. How can we support you? to? to well, to truth, truth be told, we are, uh, we are trying to build revenue. Revenue is the best source of investment capital. Absolutely. So, and, and, and building revenue, as I say, what we're also, we're not just kind of looking for, you know, folk, folks that kind of throw money at us. We want partners. You know, we want people that we can be proud of to say, you know, are a part of what's supporting us. And we also want, you know, people that, you know, clearly see that, you know, we can return some value to us. So, uh, and, in, and, and yes, we are targeting or we do want to go to those, you know, companies and institutions who have within this last year been putting voice to what it is that they said that they want to do to try to, you know, make greater impacts toward diversity, you know, toward their uh, support for social justice. One of the things that we we are, you know, actually saying, you know, when we when we talk to those folks is that now we're in a situation where companies, it's it's not just that people have to like your product or believe in your product, right? They have to also like what you stand for as a company, right? And your stakeholders, whether they're your employees whether they're your investors, whether it's even the community you reside in, they want to see that you as a company share at least in some part some of the same values that they do. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. And so we think that AwokeNet is a great opportunity for them to do that, right? By partnering with us, we can give them, we, allow, we give them the opportunity to really show in a very visible, tangible way that they share some of these same values. Couldn't agree more. And I'm very excited for the future for WokeNet. You've made so much progress in just the little time that we've known each other, but um, very excited to see everything that you've got going on at WokeNet and you're building your team. You've got some great organizations on your site. You're just doing fantastic work, honestly. And, and you know, I, I don't say that lightly. It, it really is a powerful mission. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. It's been a terrific discussion and I, as as we predicted, just a great way for people to understand what living your mission as a company is truly. Well, and and so I gotta much. say, John, this 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 comports with measures up to all of the other kind of like conversations that we've had like this. You know that most of the time when we were like talking, it was this. You know, we had the same kind of like you know enthusiastic energy going to the point where we had to say, okay, look, I guess you know we both got to go back and you know get to do some serious work. But man, great to talking it, right? to you, and let's let's keep in touch. Really, sure. I'm always I always sure. I always come away from talking to you feeling better. Really, I do. No, I appreciate that. Likewise, on my side too. So. For anyone who's listening at home, uh, if you would like more information about how to partner or connect with uh, Lauren, check out awokenet.com or feel free to email us at founders trust podcast at markettrust.io. We also have some additional information on the company that Lauren's been great to share with us. So, Lauren, thank you so much again. Really excited to, to issue this you know episode out for, for everyone to listen to and uh, keep doing the great things that you're doing. We look forward to having you back on soon. And like we say, you know, shout out to all of our, to, to our Founder Institute family. And like I said, there's so many guys, you're going to be, John is going to be showing you guys like so many, you know, cool businesses and, and, and great people that like we have met. And yeah, we want to, we want to reach, we want to connect with all of you. Really, we really do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Lauren, thank you so much again and looking forward to having you on the show uh, as soon as, you know, whenever you're willing to come back. We, love, we always love having you on. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Today, we wanted to provide you with a Twitter resource that all early stage founders should be following. 
Most entrepreneurs know by now that Stanford has played a critical role in the development of Palo Alto as a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship. But the university has also created a number of resources to expand its reach to entrepreneurs around the globe. One of these helpful resources is the Stanford eCorner, which provides daily insights into innovation, startup research, and entrepreneurial thought leadership. I highly recommend checking them out at Twitter handle at eCorner or at eCorner.stanford.edu. So let me know what you think of this episode. Comment on our social media or send us an email at founderstrustpodcast at markettrust.io. Now go get building.